It's time for Python on Hardware. Yay, Blinka! What's new in Python on Hardware? Glad you asked. So, um, let's go over to the newsletter. Okay. So, Scott was on the um, Real Python, the Real Python podcast, and this was building with Circuit Python and constraints of Python for microcontrollers. And uh, tune in. I'm going to talk about Linux in a second. We're going to get to that. And um, a little bit of a congratulations, 150 issues altogether. We've done this wow. business 150 times. That's so cool. Yeah. We have almost like 10,000 subscribers, right? It's like 9,000. Yeah, we're yeah. crossing the 9,000 mark. I yeah. think it, it's the most popular Python on hardware newsletter out there. It's for <laughs> sure. And it's free and there's no ads. And we try to always put good stuff in it. I, I send stuff that I see. There's stuff that makes it to the blog and some stuff that actually doesn't that I'm like, oh, this is kind of for the newsletter, not the blog. So this is a... Um, it doesn't replace the blog. It's good to have both because there's not there's some overlap, but not fully. Yeah, um, we have Arduino embracing Python. That yes. was good to see. So we we talked about that last project. week. Yeah, Professor John Gallagher uh, has the Circuit Python School. This is a full video course oh, for the fall. Yeah. yeah, look at this. Kind of nice. Um, talk about our different. Issues. Oh, I love this MTA sign MTA thing. MTA sign. So they, they did the thing that's really hard. So by the way, anyone who's like, how hard can it get, could it possibly be to get proper MTA data? Actually really fucking hard. They use like this crazy protobuf format and it's like, it doesn't tell you when the train's coming, just what track segment, it's like bonkers. So they simplified it and they give you an endpoint that you can use to like get yeah. the data you want, which is very nice of them. All right, um, you can see uh, some really neat Circuit Python powered game. So this is, you know, asteroids like. Yeah. Um, but it is a really, really, really neat. Yes, and we've updated. You know, we we've been updating and improving um, the keyboard stuff, which is going to affect uh, gaming because now you can catch key presses even if you miss the button press. Like we have a, yeah. it captures an event. Okay, so a lot of this more, um, and of course, there's still a ton and ton of new bits of hardware that supports Python, and mm -hmm. then there's also a lot going on with what you can do once you have Python on hardware. Lots of keyboard stuff, lots of machine learning stuff, lots of LED stuff. So this week's topic, Lady Ada, that I want to talk about, yes. it's in the newsletter, is Linux turned 30 years old. That's right. And we have a little bit of a this post about it. Famous Linus Usenet was post. doing this 30 years ago. Yes. So I have a, a two-part question for you. Mm. Um, first up, why has Linux been so important. I'm not going to say like innovative and I'm not going to say um, valuable because those are words that are normally not associated with like an open source. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think those are, I mean, I think those are like, you know, why did it work out? They're clickbaity. Yeah. I think, you know, Linux, you know, one thing I will say is Linux did, did not really make it to the desktop and I think that's actually okay. I mean, it did in, in a sense, you know, Linux and and BSD, and, Chromebooks, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's Chromebooks and, and underlying, um, you know, Mac OS 10, and of course, you know, there's there's uh, the Windows uh, uh, subsystem Linux that's available in, in Windows 10 now. So, you know, every operating system that you would use on the desktop does have access to Linux or Unix-like operating systems underneath. I mean, it turns out that people just they want more from an operating system, and that's fine. I think that. Um, where it's totally one, of course, is is the the servers and embedded uh, machinery like that. It's it's just totally dominated yeah. by. And Linux. why do you think that is? Because that's the, that's the leap I don't see. Um, a lot of these like it's Linux thirty years. Like, wh why do you think it, it's used for that? I think you know there's there's the it is free. Um, it's easy to develop for. But I think the thing that makes it you know so powerful is that you can strip apart it's very it's very modular in a sense so you can strip it apart and strip it down to run on you know very simple hardware um but also build it up to build you know to create uh fairly complicated um user interfaces i mean like you know you, you of course still see blue screens of death lots of things are still running windows um, because windows is essentially free with a computer but um you know one thing that's nice about linux is it can really be customized in a way that of course windows you'll never be able to because with linux you can create you know we had a custom distribution that we did you can really customize it. you can write device drivers you can do the specialty stuff that is very hard to do with linux i mean every sorry hard to do with windows or mac um, with linux you know the moment you install linux you have access to all the tools you need to plug into it to extend it and customize it and you see that a lot you know a lot of embedded linux 
um, distributions have custom binary blobs. You can argue whether that's good or bad, um, but it, it is something that you can do. You know, if you want to, it, it's possible for a single individual to port Linux to something like the Raspberry Pi, mm -hmm. right? Whereas porting Windows to the Raspberry Pi is just not possible. You know, that's a, that you have to get mm -hmm. Windows involved. You have to get Microsoft to, to sign on to it. You don't have access to that. Yeah. And I think that that, um, that customization, that ability, it's, it's such a small, th it's, it's a thing that not many people need to do, but if you want to have hardware that, that has an operating system underneath it, and you need to have an operating system to do IoT stuff now, it's very, very hard to connect to the internet or to deal with mass amounts of data without yeah, why the reinvent underpinning. that? Yeah, it's just, I mean, you can have individual devices that are not Linux based, but like, you know, the you know, people always come to us and they're like, okay, you know, I want to have ethernet with SSL, what should I do? And I just say like, just get a Raspberry Pi. You know, if you're, if yeah. you're, if you're, if you're just, unless you are so power and size constrained, honestly, it's cheaper just to get embedded Linux to do what you want because you have access to like, all of the tools, you know, you can parse data. You don't have to reinvent everything yeah. over and over again. So I think that's where, from a hardware point of view, that's where I all think right. it's powerful. And shout out to Bunny who saw this coming with the Chumbi where he was doing Linux on hardware before mm. all of us. Yeah, so, I mean, I love the, ch the, the Chumbi was amazing. Um, it wasn't the first, you know, the PC-104s I think had Linux beforehand. It wasn't the first embedded Linux board, but it was the first one where the idea was, um, you know, here here is a development board that has GPIO and that has... Linux and that has just enough hardware capability to, to interface with. You can still see our first Chumbi guide where I was like, oh my God, I connected an accelerometer to Linux and I could read accelerometer data and then send that over TCP IP to something else. I don't even know if the people were using MQTT at the time, so it wasn't like I sent it to, maybe there was people that sent it to Patch Bay or something, but it was, it was kind of amazing. It was like, okay, we've got hardware and you've got software and you can actually that firmware, it, firmware got eaten by software. It just, you know, I, I have opinions about um, right. device drivers. So part but, two of my question yeah. is, so we're the, not the only authors, but we've tried to do something, I think pretty important with Linux and Python, and we called it Blinka. How, how does that all interact? Because Linux had to happen for this to happen. And Circuit Python had to happen. For yeah, I think I think the computers just got fast enough. Embedded Linux computers got fast enough that they can run Python, and and to me that's really uh, powerful because you know I've, I've spent um, I know Python isn't perfect with versioning and packaging. There there's flaws with it, but it's not nearly as for for a lot of simple things. It's not nearly as extraordinarily frustrating as um, trying to cross compile C code. Um, from driver to, from, from computer to computer, especially, you know, when you're dealing with stuff like GPIO, now we have the GPID, but historically you would have to, you know, memory map stuff um, to get access to some of this hardware, which just kind of really made it, made it very unportable. And so having, a, you know, a, a layer like Python made it easy. And I kind of, you know, I, I, I liked Perl a lot more, but, um, you know, we saw Python sort of winning the, the interpreted language fight. And so we're like, okay, we're gonna go in on, all in on Python. And um, you can see my um, Linux Australia talk. There's a Linux conference Australia talk and it, it goes into this for like 45 minutes of, of the evolution of, of why I decided to have a circuit Python compatibility layer on Linux. Um, suffice to say, you really, really want to have one driver um, for every, I, I don't like to have you know four different drivers, one for MicroPython, one for C, one for SDK, one for Arduino. You know, I can have one that's C-like and one that's Python-like, and you know we're done. Everything else, just try to stick to um, a standard. And so for us, CircuitPython and Blinka was was that yeah. standard that we're now um, seventy-six different boards and porting. And here's the thing: it actually works really well. We get very little support questions yeah. for all of the different boards. I mean, we get more questions asking to to support new boards, but for the most part, you can pick up any of these devices and then pick up. Any of our, you know, I squared C sensors and plug them in, and they will just work, uh, which is sure. like pretty cool. Making it easy. Pretty cool. Okay, and that's uh, I want to spend a little time on this because the point is Linux is thirty years. Check out the LCA talk. I really maybe someone can post the link because it really like I, I spent a yeah. lot of time on it, and it was I did I think like January twenty first or something. It was mid January, and because uh, I remember you were you were helping me with the talk, and it, it really goes into. People yeah. are like, why, why did you decide to do this? I explain everything of why you can, you can argue with me that I didn't decide right, but I'll explain to you why I decided yeah. it. 
And uh, while we're in here, people are asking about CircuitPython and are there third party libraries? And yes, we have the community bundle and a bunch yeah, of the 50 libraries, yeah, and a yeah. bunch of the contributors uh, happen to just be in the chat too. So um, I really look. I mean, I know, you know a this. new standard is a standard, which means you have now another standard. But really, if you're going to write driver code that you want to run on Linux, please, please, please write it using our CircuitPython compatibility layer. We will take care of all the nonsense of making it work from board to board. And even I squared C, you often need your GPIO pin for reset or for address select or for interrupt. And, and that stuff is not well exposed in Linux. That's, that's what the annoying part is. Each board has a slightly different way of, of doing GPIO. And so we kind of yeah. abstracted that away for you. And you know, yes, you can use Sisyphus, but sometimes Sisyphus isn't available, you know, or they don't use it yeah. or it's very slow. Um, so it's like, it, you know, it's a solution looking for a problem or vice versa. I'll put uh, one more question in for this. Yeah. Uh, is it safe to assume that any CircuitPython board that's in there now will be supported forever? Probably. To but some like, extent. Yeah. I, I think that the, the SAMD... It might not be physically available. The SAMD 21s will eventually just not be able to support a lot of the stuff that we do because the, the chips are just small. So I think, you know, if you're... I think the bigger chips, you know, they're going to last longer. It's a little bit like Arduino. Like we still... We still sell the original trinket with the AT Tiny 85, but yeah. I really don't recommend it. We tell people, don't buy this. People do, and we tell them, do not buy it. It's only for old projects. Yeah, but to flip that around, yeah. it's uh, when we do an update with CircuitPython, uh, hundreds of boards get all updated yeah. you know, right away. Okay, and that's Python on Hardware this week.